I'm Glenn Peterson, and uh, I'm an anthropologist. I'm a professor of anthropology and chairman of the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. Well, anthropology is a field that has, uh, I, I'd like to think, and probably anthropologists would differ about this. We have a balance of uh, theoretical ideas about what it means to be human, about how we got to be human, and observation. And I'm going to use the word empiricism a lot, which to me to means you go out and you, act, you look at what's actually happening. And so some articles tend to be more theoretical, and some articles tend to be more observational or empirical, and that's called ethnography. And I think of myself as primarily an ethnographer, and I've spent years living in the small island societies, and so uh, what I'm writing about here is some very closely observed behaviors of the people that I work with, but I've put them into a theoretical context. I'm Elizabeth Wallman. I'm assistant professor of fine and performing arts at Baruch College here <laughs> in the Weissman School. Scholarship in music goes in several different directions. Uh, it's a little bit funny that way. I think most people, when you say you're an art historian, you study art and you look at the history of art, and when you say uh, you are, I don't know, I mean, I'm not sure about different disciplines, but when it comes to music, there are several different divisions in terms of music scholarship. Composers uh, write music, theorists, examine the, the, the notes on the page that other people have left behind. Musicologists are people that at least historically specialize in Western uh, music, the history of Western music. So Mozart, Bach, Beethoven, Brahms, at least that's traditionally the way that it was. And ethnomusicologists, again, at least traditionally, were people that specialized in um, uh, non-Western, sort of an anthropological approach to non-Western uh, musics, right? So people that wanted to study the music of India or wanted to study the music of Africa, and that's basically the division between ethnomusicology and musicology. It's changed a little bit in my generation, so there are people like myself who are, musical who are ethnomusicologists but uh, focus most of their attentions on Western forms. Is that clear? I hope that makes sense. So my specialty as an ethnomusicologist is actually uh, American popular forms, especially with rock music, um, Western popular music, and especially musical theater. So um, one of the things that I think ethnomusicologists attempt to do, back to your original question, is uh, trying to make sense of music as a cultural uh, a form of expression, right? Why do people make music? How does music fit into culture, or different cultures all around the world, including our own at this point? And uh, so most people in my field go out into the field. So in other words, they go to the place that they're studying. So I study Western music. I live in the United States. I tend to do most of my work in the theater right now because I write musical th about musical theater, so I spend a lot of time watching rehearsals, talking to people in the musical theater. But people similarly who are really interested in, for example, the music of India, will actually go and live in India and study music there and spend time sort of learning about the culture of India and uh, various different ways that people live in India and then how the music fits in to that um, mindset, I suppose. The purpose of the article that I chose um, is basically when I was in graduate school in the, so over, what is it, more than 10 years ago at this point, a really long time ago, but um, what I started to notice is that I was listening to this one particular rock music station, and it was um, a classic rock station with a little bit of an alternative uh, bent to it. And they were only playing, this was in the 90s, and what I noticed was the, the 90s was a time in terms of uh, alternative and, and, and sort of the late classic rock. That was a time when there were lots and lots of women making music. You know, we had L7 and Bikini Kill and all of these different groups. Hole was out. Um, and this station played absolutely none of it. They would not play any of it. And um, people would call and request. I had friends that would call and request. I would call and request nothing, 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 nothing they ever played. So I got really interested in trying to figure out why exactly that was, like why this, this 
station that is sort of in the middle of New York City that's supposed to be like sort of playing current hits was only playing half of the current hits that were out there at the time. Mary McGlynn, Associate Professor, Department of English. Mostly people are writing to make comments on already published literary texts, um, poems, short stories, fiction, um, plays, novels, but people also write to explain how they have taught texts like that before, and some people write more kind of creative work. Also within this department we have several creative writers. The article I selected is actually something that I wrote um, that was published in a book called, or a journal called New Hibernia Review, and it is called Pregnancy, Privacy, and Domesticity in the Snapper. The Snapper is a Roddy Doyle novel um, about a girl who gets pregnant and um, how she and her family deal with that. So I wrote it um, because I read a lot of book reviews about it that I felt, you know, in the kind of popular press were making negative assumptions about certain Irish working class characters and I wanted to kind of correct that and larger to take Roddy Doyle, the author, who I think is often read as kind of just a popular author and make a case that he's actually somebody that serious literary criticism ought to be addressing also. My name is uh, Mehmet Gench and I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Management. To communicate, basically. Um, I, I once had a discussion with one of my professors and what he told me was that academics communicate in writing. And so anything they want to say, any thesis they want to make, any argument they want to make, um, any critique they want to make of others' works, they usually do that in writing. The purpose of the article is basically to fill a gap in, in the literature that we found and to, to explore a question, um, a phenomenon and which is the rise of companies from developing countries, so-called emerging markets, which is becoming a popular topic. Um, but you know, it, the research always lags behind the phenomenon. So it's catching up and we basically wanted to contribute to research in that area.